Still okay. can I just mm -hmm. say a word of welcome on behalf of the Astronomy Center? Um, believe it or not, this is only the second time that you actually addressed us. The last time was physically still at Sandra. I think some of us have heard talks you gave at the Southern Star Party. So at least all of, all of us that have heard you before know that this evening will not be boring and we're all looking forward to it. The biography, oh, which Derek shared on the screen earlier, was sent together with the Zoom invitation to all the people that are attending this evening. But I do think there are just a few interesting comments. Uh, you started off with a very, very typical qualification for a career in astronomy, namely a degree in anthropology. <clears throat> um, I think people that are in Cape Town quite regularly will, I'm sure have listened to some of your weekly looking up uh, broadcasts on fine music radio. Uh, you were a past member and a chairperson, in fact, of the Cape Center and still a member of the committee. Um, I'm not going to ask too much detail, but I'm not quite sure what you mean by having run over the moon for 10 years. I assume it's a guided tour of its objects. Um, recently, she became a founder member of the Center for Astronomical Heritage, which is doing outstanding work. Oka and Ian Glass are involved in that as well. And then lastly, she was elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2016. Quite an impressive biography. Uh, Ketchel, welcome. We're looking forward to hearing what you share with us this evening. <clears throat> it's, it's nice to be with the Hermanus group uh, again. And uh, before I say anything else, anyone can interrupt at any time or raise a hand or whatever it is. But if I'm presenting, I may not see the raised hand. So you might just have to start speaking. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, so do interrupt at any time. Now, uh, that introduction said that my talk won't be boring, but now you're recording, so I can't say anything rude. Um, what a pity, because you're gonna put this onto the internet. So I've, I've gotta be on my best behavior. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I'll start off with something I'm extremely proud of, uh, which is nothing to do with astronomy, but I just think it's so lecker. Um, because we, we were talking earlier about, you know, Zoom meetings and, and how they are. And I started a piece of work with the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory in the middle of last year as their, their scrum master, which is the kind of project manager. And I hadn't met these dudes, you know, so I have this whole team that I'm managing and I've not, not met them. And um, so I, I did eventually meet, meet them or some of them. We had a, we had a meal in an out, outdoor restaurant. And I thought, how are they going to recognize me, you know, from Zoom? You know, I could, I could be any sort of height or, or girth or whatever, you know. I thought they're not going to recognize me. So I made this device. And it is, I suppose, in a tenuous way, it is linked to visualization. It's how we see things, you know. So here it is. Uh, oh, I'm going to have to take my, I'm going to have to take my background off, aren't I? Um, let me take my background off. Can you please stop the other videos. Uh, so, uh, so you can see this Sorry. wonderful device here. Um, so my colleagues could recognize me because I made this little, uh, this little like Zoom console here. And it's got, it's got all the, the various buttons that work. And it's got a little, a little uh, screen, a little curtain that comes down. If you, if if you kill the video. Um, and it's also very COVID friendly because it's got acetate there, you see. So, um, so this is what, what I think we have to adopt these kinds of, of tools and techniques to get over the fact that, you know, we need to gently ease ourselves back into the non-Zoom world. Um, because I must say that this, the Zoom world is my world these days. Um, and it would be anyway, actually, because, um, you know, a lot of the people I work with are in different countries and they're in these really pesky time zones because, you know, the world is kind of spherical. And so there's all these different times. People seem to want to get up when the sun's rising. I don't know why we don't have just one time zone in the whole world. It doesn't matter if you get up at three o'clock in the morning, given it's so what. Uh, but the problem is, is that we've got people in Canada, people in the Far East, 
people in the in the southern states of the US and blah blah and they're all on these different time zones so um, I'm often working at odd times myself and on zoom you know because we can't be flying around all the time but anyway that's a bit of, a bit of a, a long and winding introduction by the way the over the, the the over the moon thing over the moon tours that's a company that I set up with Christy Koning who many of you may know and this was doing astro tourism and uh, we, we've disbanded the company now because we've got too busy with other things, but we enjoyed ourselves setting up uh, various facilities with Cape Nature and, uh, and uh, going around um, showing the night skies to tourists. And so that's what that was about. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to start the talk. So I've got a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, just before we started, <clears throat> Derek said that I can share my screen in a particular way and, and you might be able to see my face at the same time. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure about this. Let's have a look. So can you see? Oh, hang on. Let's have a look. All right. So, so what, what can you guys see? Yeah, we can see your screen and I've, I've maximized the screen. So mm -hmm. your screen and your video is on the side, just minimize. Okay, that's perfect. That's really great. Okay. Um, so uh, anyway, so here we are. This is, uh, I work, I have two jobs. So I work for the Inter-University Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy. It took me a while to practice saying that. I can say it now. This is at the University of Cape Town. It's based there in the Department of Astronomy. Uh, but it also includes the University of Pretoria, University of the Western Cape, Sol Plaki, and I've maybe missed out a couple, a couple there. And uh, we have joined together to create facilities for really for high performance computing and big data work, chiefly astronomy. But we also uh, we also cater for bioinformatics. So this is a multidisciplinary institution of statisticians, astronomers high performance computing people and, uh, and people like me, I'm a project manager. So I'm the project manager for IDEA. And uh, that's, you know, that's what, that's what we're doing. We're creating the facilities and that's the computing, chiefly the compute facilities for big data. And at the same time, I'm also this project manager for a team at the South African Radio Astronomy Institute. This is the Meerkat and Meerkat Plus team. As many of you will know, Max Planck Institute in Germany has donated money for an extra 20 dishes. So there's the initial 64 meerkat dishes and now there's gonna be another 20. So there'll be 84 meerkat dishes. So I'm project managing that team. And as I say, I hadn't seen them before. It's really peculiar working with people who you've never seen. Um, and you know, you don't know what they look like and <laughs> all different sizes and shape anyway. Uh, so, so that's it. So I do two, two different things. I've also got the radio show. Um, and, uh, and in the good old days used to perform, perform outreach. Okay, so that's, uh, that's idea. And what I'm gonna talk about is chiefly astronomical imaging because that's a lot of what I do. I sort of make the tools available. Uh, so most of my background has been in information technology and I've been in the kind of IT or information systems realm for most of my career. And uh, there's three parts, so I'm going to raise a lot of questions about data visualization because this is about data. So as you, you're probably aware, you know, astronomers these days are data scientists. Uh, they're not people who, who walk out and put their eye against eyepieces doing what I call real astronomy. Um, you know, they don't actually look at the stars and to radio astronomers, a star is simply a point source. They're not the tiniest bit romantic, these people. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, you know, how you visualize this data and, and what it means. And then I'm going to describe what's called the pipeline. So the pipeline is a whole set of processes and, and tools that you have to have in order to render the data visible and in order to render it faithfully and accurately and to give an accurate representation of what's there. And that's extremely complicated. And then finally, I'll give a quick uh, demonstration of one of the tools that, uh, that actually produces images of the, this astronomical data. 
And so, as you know, you know, now we're into this epoch with massive amounts of data. And uh, it's, you know, mostly what people do is look at two dimensional graphs. And in the old days, you know, these, these academics produce these things called papers, papers. And I don't know why I'm saying it in American accent, but anyway, papers. And these, the flappy things, in fact, I've got some here. I've got a piece of flappy paper here. There we go. Uh, a piece of flappy paper. This is, a, this is a very useful piece of flappy paper. And it was given to me by Fine Music Radio because I'm a, one of the presenters. And so this is a certificate saying I'm a, a useful dude. Um, I've got a permit to travel to perform a service, a piece of paper. You flap this at somebody and it's got a stamp on it. It's got a stamp on it. Isn't that cute? Stamp. Um, but this is not how modern people operate with flappy pieces of paper, even though this, the academics still call things papers and still expect to th see things on two dimensions. But how can you represent data on two dimensions when it is multidimensional? What we're moving into now is not only looking at data in, uh, in time series and in many, many di dimensions and stepping through data and animating data on a essentially a two-dimensional screen, which poses as a three-dimensional area. Uh, but as you know, we're, we're starting to look at using things like planetaria and virtual reality headsets. And this is the, some of my colleagues work in these realms, but how we actually immerse ourselves in the data and look at the data in a much more dynamic way than just a, a two-dimensional graph. Um, so, uh, I mean, this, this, actually this whole talk was, it was inspired by one of the WhatsApp groups that I'm on, the Cape Stargaze, Cape Stargaze, is it called? Anyway, I'm on that, that with uh, one or two people in this group. And uh, there was a novice astrophotographer and um, he said, you know, how do you like my, my first image? And one of the seasoned astrophotographers said, it's a bit over-processed. Well, what does that mean? Because, you know, you take, this, you take this raw data that's coming from the skies and then you do various things to it to make it into something that the human eye can interpret and understand. What does overprocessing mean? So we ended up having this long talk about what we meant by overprocessing. And, and what it came down to was the kind of aesthetics of what, you know, how people expected to see images. And this discussion on aesthetics happened at a time when we had one of the, the, the giants in this topic visit, uh, visit idea. And uh, she sort of exploded the, the whole topic of astronomical imaging. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the technology of astronomical imaging, but I'm gonna start by talking a bit more to sort of to, to get us thinking about how we see things because the human brain system, the brain eye system, it's, it's a bit odd. As you probably know, our eyes are not like cameras, which kind of just passively take in all of this material around us. No, 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 no. We, we, we imagine, we have an idea of a map of what we think ought to be around us. And then we sort of come towards that. Uh, the brain kind of works out, oh, I expect to see this and this is what's happening. And it kind of come, meets the, the, what, what is actually out there in the middle. And we miss a huge amount. So when I was in the, the sixth form, this is in, in the, on the Scottish border and in a town called Carlisle. So that's where I did, went to high school and we got given all the, the camera equipment from the nearby studio, television studio, who were moving from color to black and white. So we got all this black and white gear to do what we, whatever we wanted with. So we also had a spacesuit, a real spacesuit. I, I don't know where we got this from, right? And it was, it was huge. So it was only the really tall guy whose name I've forgotten who could, who could wear this. So what we did is that we, we went off into town with this guy wearing this spacesuit. And we hid behind shop doorways and things and we filmed what went on. And when we got back and we looked at the video of what, it's just extraordinary. People did not see the spaceman and he was kind of doing a spacewalk, you know, walking through. People didn't, I should rephrase this. 
adults didn't see him. There'd be the kids in the prams, like, look, 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 mommy, look, mommy, look, mommy, it's a spaceman, look. And the mummies didn't see it. And I've no doubt that you could go and interview half those people afterwards and they would say, no, nothing strange. No, no, didn't see anything strange. And some of you may have seen this, this video. Uh, there's a video which, which features a gorilla. And, uh, and this, this gorilla appears and you don't see it. It's, it's really strange. It, it's really, really weird. And this is a great demonstration of the fact that we see what we expect to see. And that's also the case with astronomical images. We have an aesthetic, we have a kind of idea, a, a, a vocabulary, a visual vocabulary of what we expect to see. So how do we make sure, given that there's a lot of making things up going on with our, with our vision, with our visual system, how do we, we make sure that what we are seeing, what we are rendering is, is real, is authentic? Um, and how do we render this faithfully? How do we reproduce this? And reproducible data is a huge topic these days in science because it's not only astronomy, but many of the topics, uh, subjects where, where you have to put data through a pipeline, through a whole series of processes uh, before it comes out the other end into whatever it is that you're expecting to see. What happens if you take that same raw data and put it through a different set of processes or a very similar one, just a different load of software? Um, you know, we all know that in, in the old days, you know, when you took photographs and you would buy film and one, you know, Fuji film um, might render colours in a slightly different way than, than Kodak film did um, because the, the, the actual substrate was slightly different, slightly different chemicals. So which is the true representation of what really was there? You know, well, of course, now it's, it's n times more complicated. Um, so, you know, the, the scientists and the technicians are very, very concerned about this. How do we make sure that, that the software that we're developing uh, means that the raw data that you push through that will end up looking like something that really is there and uh, not a lot of <clears throat> made up mush. So now the expert, Professor Jane English, she visited, she visited IDEA. She's from the University of Manitoba. She's Canadian. And um, she, she gave a talk to us in which she, she blew up, she blew apart the, the topic of astronomical visualization and revealed it not to be the, the science, you know, the exact science that you might think it is. She, her first degree, just as my first degree was in anthropology, her first degree was in fine art. And then she did a degree in, in astronomy, she became an astronomer. So she's a fully fledged astronomer, most of her life, she has been just kicking out astronomical papers you know, in science, but she also works in this field. And she's also uh, was, was one of the team behind the Hubble Heritage Project. And many of you may know, I don't know if you know about the Hubble Heritage Project. And this was a project that was devised at one time to just produce a lot of kind of meaningful images for the general public and put them in one place, put them on a website. So people could, could go and appreciate the kinds of images that the Hubble had taken. And so she was part of that. She was you know, curating the, the images, the science images out there uh, for, the, for the public. Um, and then she, she realized that actually what she needed to do was to, to strike a balance between what is aesthetically beautiful and pleasing and what represents science accurately or what will allow the scientists to see things in that data. Um, because as at the same time as, as looking at graphs, and I'll show you this later in the demonstration uh, of Carter, they, they're looking at graphs, but they're also looking at the image and seeing what, what is interesting in that image. Just as when we're out stargazing and we put our eye against the eyepiece doing what I call real astronomy, um, we are seeing what's interesting there, what's noteworthy, what, what have, I not, have I not seen before? Um, you know, what's new? So what do we mean when we are representing parts of the spectrum that our eyes cannot see? In radio astronomy, it's all of it. You know, what does this mean? If you are making an image, a visual image that the human eye brain system can make sense of, what does it mean 
if that data originally was not intended or the, the eye was not intended to see that stuff. How do we do this? And as she puts it, you know, how do you respect visual grammar? You know, the, the, the kind of differences in light and shade and, you know, how do you do this? And, uh, you know, and, and the last point here that there's more than one statistically valid image can be produced by the same data by running it through different pipeline software. Um, so this is some of her work. This is some of her work in the, in the Hubble Heritage Project. And here you see, you know, they've taken uh, NGC 2525 and they have, you know, uh, put some extra information there, put a compass here, put a, a little, um, uh, you know, scale marker here, 4.6 kiloparsecs. And in one of the images, there's even more annotation than this because this blue object uh, at the, the bottom corner, that blue object is a supernova going off. So there's something even more sort of relevant and striking about that image. Um, and then here we have uh, NGC 3314, which is actually two images. And, you know, Jan English said of this, you know, that, that we attempt to preserve the scientific integrity of a celestial object while enhancing it visually. And they're not mutually exclusive. Um, so for example, here, you may take a well-known image and rotate it. So it's not in the same orientation and astronomer, that astronomers are, are used to seeing uh, in the catalogues of celestial objects. And that little change can make the image more dynamic and it can add depth. And it can mean that there's different, uh, different questions you might answer about that image, just doing something simple like, like turning it around. And um, so visual literacy, yes, it's unconsciously absorbed. Uh, and artists know a lot about this, um, but, you know, scientists, not so much. So mostly scientists will use color palettes for particular reasons, not just to create a striking image, um, but to try and enhance certain features, just as we use filters um, on, on our kinds of telescopes so that it can pick out dust lanes or pick out contrast in nebulae and, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, as she says here, uh, the, the end goal is an image that is sufficiently naturalistic that it convinces the viewer of the existence of the depicted astronomical phenomenon. And that, that is a, an important sentence because it's, it's talking about producing an image which is convincing and at the same time has some scientific relevance. And so what she attempts to do is meld the two. And this is something of a black art. Uh, so I'm just going to play a little bit here and um, you know there's the just to show you just I mean you probably have have done these kinds of things before to show you how the how the eye system is maybe not what you expect it to be so I'm going to ask you to stare stare at the middle of this image for a while and if you just stare at the middle of that image and let your eyes drink it in for for a few seconds and what this demonstrates is that the, your color perception is, uh, is, is rather odd. Uh, it's, not, it's not fixed. And that uh, I'm going to show you a blank screen now and tell me what colors you end up seeing. Can you still see the smiley face or did I not do it long enough? I just Anybody see a white screen, sorry. Oh, I didn't do it long enough then. If you, if you stare at this for long enough and then you stare at the white screen, what happens is that the opposite colors become apparent um, and, and you see a, a smiley face, but with the opposite colors and it should be something like yellow and blue. Uh, and it's a bit, it's very strange. Um, and, um, you know, you think, well, don't these colors mean something? Um, does, it, does it work now? No, maybe you need to not, go back. Not and... for me. I don't know about anybody else. I saw a, a, a very light uh, yellow, uh, yellow green. Okay. Surface. You see green as well. Mm. A, a light mm. green, a yellow green yeah. background. I still see the white color. I think what, it might what... depend on the sort of screen you have. 
I think it, I think it probably just wasn't done long enough. I, I, I didn't want to just stand there waiting for everybody's ro rods to get zoned out. Um, but what this demonstrates is that, that the eyes see colour in particular ways, and then they see the opposites of colour in particular ways. You obviously see colour differently at night when your rods are activated and not your cones. And then there's this issue with warm and cool colours. Um, and this is something that, that scientists ought to know about. Scientists who are producing papers, those flappy pieces of paper, and they are reproducing images. So if you look at if you look at this, these images here, the you've got warm and cool colours here. So warm colours jump out and cool colours recede. Um, but actually, what so when you see this, when you see this galaxy, this this NGC 3256 on the on the right, it's on my right. It looks as if the red is coming towards you. So it looks as if the galaxy is moving around with the blue receding and the red coming to the fore. But actually it's the opposite of what's happening in reality. In reality, the blue is coming towards the earth and the red is receding. But it's just that when we see a warm color like that red, it, it appears to be closer to us and bigger. So there's lots of these little uh, sort of visual illusions that we know about with the, with the human eye and that we need to be aware of if we're going to be reproducing these colors um, in a way which supports the scientific reality of what's there. So that's the, the message. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on and talk about some of the technology some of the technology connected to, um, actually before I do that, I just want to talk, mention something uh, peculiar, which, which is that, you know, I used to travel a lot and I traveled to places where people weren't used to seeing, you know, books and pamphlets and posters and, and maps. And there are many cultures where a map is, is incomprehensible. They, they, look at a map and it wouldn't make any sense to them, to them at all. It's just lines and blobs with writing on it. And that's because they weren't raised with this idea that there's a sort of visual literacy of maps and what you expect to see in a map. Um, but further than that, I would show people photographs, photographs of buildings which were entirely foreign to them. And they wouldn't see, I'd say, what do you see in this photograph? And they wouldn't see anything. They just see there's a gray shape here, there's a dark black shape there, there's a white shape here. They wouldn't identify windows and doors and, and actual edges of buildings because it's not within their visual literacy. In the same way that, you know, a, a novice anthropologist will go into a, a village and not understand that over there is the chief's hut and over here is the women's area and this is the cooking area and I mustn't walk through there because it's it's very, you know, very bad form to do that. And as soon as I come into the village, I must go to this particular hut and talk to this particular person. And a novice anthropology won't see that. And in some villages, you have very, very minimal markers, minimal to an outsider markers of what's happening in that place. Um, so it's interesting that people, and they, they say that, I don't know if this is true, but they say that when, Columbus first sailed that the natives didn't see the ship arriving. They just didn't see it because they didn't expect to see it. They had no visual literacy to, to, for this conception of a ship on the sea in the same way that um, in the same way that those people who were out shopping in Carlisle on a Tuesday lunchtime did not see the spacemen walking through. Um, because they didn't expect to see it. So there's a lot to this topic of how you represent astronomical data. Anyway, back to the data here. Uh, so as you know, we've got this enormous, uh, enormous uh, telescopes coming up and they're going to produce uh, gajillions and gajillions of data, just bucket loads of this stuff, what to do with it. And uh, so I work in the, the, the realm of the science data processor, trying to uh, make sense of how we, how we shunt this data through the pipelines 
of uh, software processes and get it to where it matters. So it's just a pretty picture of, of Meerkat, why not? I must say I haven't been to, I, I've only been to the site when there was one Meerkat dish up and uh, I'm itching to go. Has anybody been recently to, to the Meerkat site? Yes, hmm? we were probably about three years ago. A very, very interesting visit. Mm. Yeah, I can't wait for it to open up a bit and for them to let, uh, let certain people through. So we've got these things called the large survey projects. And these, each of these projects has, you know, a dozen or more astronomers, uh, or sometimes just two or three astronomers working on either imaging or time domain astronomy. So time domain is, is looking at things that go bang in the night or, you know, searching for pulsars, things which change over time, uh, sometimes quite rapidly. And they're used to be able to uh, tell distances to, to parts of the universe, amongst other things. And then we have the imaging stuff, and it's the imaging that I'm concerned with here. And these imaging projects are looking at specific parts of the spectrum, and they are producing particular kinds of data which has to be processed um, in certain ways. And it's processed on this thing called ILIFU, which means cloud. So this is a federated cloud system. It's designed to work in the cloud. So uh, the idea is that you can log on to this wherever you are in the future. Um, we're working on the, the kind of federated aspects of this. So you'll be able to log into this from perhaps other systems and then you'll be able to get at your data. And as you can imagine, when you're dealing with massive amounts of astronomical data, it's like, where is it? And uh, can you move this data or can you keep it where it is and do the processing and move the data products? And that's, you know, that's obviously the prize is you keep the data where it is, where it's, uh, where it's sitting, and then you, you pull the, whatever data you need when after the processing has occurred. So there's various different modes of doing this, you, you, you can pull the whole data to be more local and then process it locally, but it's expensive, you know, it's expensive and time consuming and difficult to shunt vast amounts of data around the world. And so there's different modes being worked, uh, worked on as to how you would manage this. Uh, so Elifu is based in Mowbray, the actual hardware, the, the, the gear, um, is there in Mowbray and it's as you see there there's a picture of those racks boring 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 they look like um you know they look like sort of locker rooms you know when you see American American movies when when all the the nurses go into a hospital they've all got lockers that look like that you know I always expect to be able to open these open these cabinets and there's like bits of magazines and books and somebody's uniform behind it but there's not there's actually racks and racks of of computing of memory chips basically tons of it and it's all quite noisy because you've got to keep this stuff cool uh, because otherwise it overheats because it's very busy there's a lot of electricity going through there and it's computing it's busy thinking uh, it's just as our brains get hot if we think too much they get hot brains hot hot brains so that's what happens. Uh, it, the data goes to Elifu and then uh, people will log in and grab that data and then process it. And they process it by putting it through pipelines. So now this is an image of what the software pipeline looks like for IDEA, uh, for Meerkat. And uh, you, know, you, you start with the, the data coming in one end and it goes churn, 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 and you put it through all these various algorithms and and then various databases come in and in the, the data is compared to other databases. And then at the end, it squirts out, you know, some, some data product. And there's three of the data products are down here. the spectral cubes and data cubes and multi-frequency synthesis images. And those are the data products that the scientist takes and does something with, you know, looks at them, changes the, the color maps, see if they look different. Uh, in different color maps or, or then analyzes the data using a tool like Carter. Um, and this is the imaging pipeline I'm a bit more familiar with. This is the science data processor for the square kilometer array. And you, you get the, the data coming in uh, from the correlator. And the correlator is the thing which sorts out the, the timing. This is associated with 
uh, with long baseline interferometry. And so it, it's, it's sorted out the timing. It's now shunting. She has still huge amounts of data. I mean, they've done some noise reduction and, uh, and sorted out some of the, the data problems with the data coming from the dishes themselves. And now it comes in for RFI flagging. That's where they, they flag up the segments of the data, which may have radio frequency interference. And they'll do that by looking at certain databases of, for example, when satellites would be going over, or, or they'll, they'll, they're just looking for bad, basically bad segments. And, and then it goes through a whole stack of different, uh, different processes. The main one actually being cal calibration of one kind or other. And, cal and calibration, is, it's, its goal is, is to be able to correct for effects that may interfere with the scientific outcome of a measurement, or I mean, they call them measurements, but it's an observation. Due to the instrument or, or local temporary conditions, um, so that you can compare these measurements to other measurements at other times, with other instruments or the frequencies. So you'll have, a, you'll have a, a very, very huge complicated chart, which is an effective database. And you will compare that sky map with you know, what you've just, uh, just surveyed. Um, and, uh, and you'll see if, if the thing makes sense. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different other kinds of calibrations that has to be done. You know, you've got to calibrate for, for the beams, uh, the radio telescope beams, you've got to calibrate for, uh, for, for every little bit along the way of, of processing that you do. You've got, to, you've got to make sure that this is actually, is this, is this how it should be? And you'll calibrate several times during an observation. Um, and you can see here, there's these calibration cycles where you, you sort of push the data through these washing machines of, of processes and, uh, and eventually clean it up. And then uh, you'll extract sources, compare them to a sky model and round and round it goes until you eventually end up with, um, with things that you can put into an archive. Um, data products you can put into an archive, which scientists can then can then discover and interrogate and uh, use tools like this, Carter, the Cube Analysis and Rendering Tool for Astronomy. And this is a, a new, relatively new imaging tool. And so we pushed out the last release in September last year. We've got a, the next one, version two, coming out at the end of May this year. And uh, this has now become the, the tool of choice for astronomers who are using big data. So it's been designed for use on the web. It's been designed for use with big data. Uh, so it has a particular file format, which it likes to use. Uh, there's a new file, file format called HDF5 and, uh, and techniques that support parallel, uh, parallel processing. So when you're, you've got a sort of a, an enormous file, and you know the Meerkat and the SK data sets, they'll need to be distributed across multiple nodes or parts of the computer at the same time, you know, to deal with the, with the memory requirements of this amount of data to go through these pipelines, you know, the calibration and whatnot. Um, and also to go through the, the other processes in actually making an image. Um, so, you know, I, on the slide before, that was just the, the science data pipelines. That was not the, the imaging per se. So now we're just talking about how you make a picture out of this massive amount of data. So it's been designed to you know, pull in data in certain numbers of chunks and deal with it at a, in, in a particular time frame. So it's been specially designed to, to make an image from radio astronomy, from massive radio astronomy files uh, particularly, I mean, radio astronomy makes, makes the huge piles. And it's been designed to do this in a person's lifetime, you know, even perhaps between power cuts, that would be a thing. In fact, I should have had a power cut this evening. I was all kind of ready with my, with my UPS and I've got, look, I've got my, I've got my, my <laughs> can, candles here <laughs> and matches. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's it's designed to actually be be fast, and at certain uh, certain operations, it's it's extremely fast. It's an order of magnitude faster than existing tools at uh, at some of its tricks. And so this is a, so this is where where we're at, and it's now replaced the the major 
image of the major viewer that's being used around the world. So we've got hundreds of users now. Um, and so this is one, this is just showing you a screenshot of what the, what the, what the scientist sees, what the astronomer sees. You'll see an image here. And all these various widgets, which allow you to define regions that you want to get a closer look at and overlay with contours from other images and, um, and all kinds of things that you can do with this. And I'll show you a bit more of this. And here's another, another image of, uh, you know, all sorts of things going on here where you've got a, a part of the Milky Way and you can see the gas in that Milky Way and you might want to, to go in and have a look at the temperature of that gas and, uh, and so on. As you, I mean, as you know, the, these colors are quite arbitrary that are being used here. And I touched on briefly, I mentioned that, you know, the future is looking multidimensional where people will put on uh, VR headsets. So we have the idea of visualization lab and we've got a thing called the, the Cobra here, which is a sort of an immersive screen which wraps around a, a person's head and when you're in that you you really feel like you're in your own little planetarium and it just gives you a, a you know a better view on things and we've also got this huge uh, visualization wall which you see here at the bottom uh, where people are looking at this uh, a whole wall and that's for that's you know it effectively offers a 110 inch screen resolution at very high pixel density um, and so it closely matches the resolution, at, at least in the horizontal direction of meerkat images. And uh, it allows about, you know, half of an entire image to be displayed at full resolution. Um, and, in, and these displays, you know, they support a very high dynamic range, which means you can have a much wider range of displayed colors and that'll enable, you know, finer details to, to be visible. Um, and um, so, so that's sort of one of the one of the tools there, one of the toys. And then Cobra is like, as I say, the Cobra is like a sort of this mini planetarium. And then we've got VR headsets, and these are to me, to my mind, are the most extraordinary because they allow you to actually walk inside your data, um, and then pan through time, or you know, select a particular channel that you want to focus on. Um, and, and walk through your data, you know, you've got the, the little joysticks there, the handsets, and you can walk through data or you can zoom in on things. And we're currently working on a, a, a new beta version, which is coming out this week of the software to do that. I mean, that's amazing. You can't, you can't write a paper about that, you know, I mean, you cannot render uh, a, a, you know, a VR experience into two dimensions anymore. And so I can imagine that the, you know, the academic paper of the future will be, you know, sending someone a URL to a, to a VR data set, um, which then someone else can experience, or you can experience it together at the same time with collaborative software and both walk through the data together and point out things that are going on. I mean, at the moment, the only data set that I think we've got now is the, uh, oh, the entire universe, <laughs> the whole thing. The entire shebang. Uh, so we've got this uh, data set in which has all the, the galaxy walls and, and filaments. That big spongy thing that is the, the universe of galaxies and you can walk through it and um, it's it's just a bit a bit mind-blowing. Um, uh, so that's what's going on. Okay so lastly here's the the final slide and then I'm going to give you a quick a quick blast of Carter. Uh, this is, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, if not all of you, this is the centre of the Milky Way. And this is the region around the supermassive black hole uh, at the centre of our Milky Way. And it was used when Meerkat was first switched on. I'm sure you know that this, you know, Meerkat was extraordinary. It switched on and, and it worked, you know. And so for the inauguration ceremony, uh, they uh, created this image. And uh, the, the colour scheme that's chosen here, obviously the centre of the universe is not on fire. Uh, I damn well hope it's not on fire. Um, so we're in trouble if it is. So the, the, um, the, the, these represent the, the brightness of the radio waves, uh, ranging from red for faint emission to orange to yellow and white for the brightest areas. 
And, and this image shows a lot of features never be seen before. I mean, we'd, we'd seen these filaments, I think back as far as the, the 80s, the late 80s, but, but very, very faintly, we didn't know what they were. And so now, you know, because we can see and zoom in on these filaments, we're going to get better ideas about what they actually are. So don't ask me because we don't know what they are really. Um, and it's also, you've got a clearer view of these supernova remnants hanging around and, and star forming regions. Um, so this is a two degree by one degree panorama. And, and that's about a thousand by 500 light years across what you're seeing there. Amazing, amazing, I love that image. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and ask for a few questions before giving you a quick blast of, of Carter. Um, so has anybody got any, got any questions they'd like to ask? No, hang on. No. Oh, you mentioned 20 extra dishes at Meerkat. It's the first time that I've heard that. What yep. design will they be? The same ones as the existing Meerkat? No, no, no. Will they'll, they'll be SKA be, dishes? They'll be SKA dishes. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, and that, that's, that will come on stream quite quickly. Um, so I don't think they're, uh, I mean, I'm not part of the hardware end of things, so I don't think they're going to be. Um, I don't think they're going to be SKA dishes shipped in from China. I think they're going to be made locally to an SKA spec. But I may be wrong in that. I don't know if anybody else has got better information. Mm. I, I ask a question. When you've collected a lot of data from some area in space which you want to visualize, how do you decide what colors to assign to the various, uh, to the data that you've collected? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the issue. How do you? And, you know, a lot of scientists will choose colors based on, you know, this, what I was talking about, visual literacy. Um, and they may choose the wrong ones because if you're looking at, at you know, galaxy kinetics and, and a galaxy which is spinning round, you, you need to choose cooler colors for the receding po portion of the galaxy and warmer colors for the portion of the galaxy that's coming mm -hmm. towards us. Um, so, you know, it's, if astronomers are going to produce striking images that the general public are going to see, then that's one thing they maybe don't need to have scientific accuracy. But if you're producing for other scientists, then you need to understand how the eye works and something of the, the sort of tricksiness or the, the illusions that our eyes are prone to. And so, I mean, I'll show you now with, with Carter, there's a lot of different color maps that you can use which, which bring up different aspects of your image. So sometimes the color map that's the rule that the scientists will use is simply just to highlight a particular feature. I don't know if that I, answers your question. I, I think that the uh, artists get away with what is called um, artistic license. So mm -hmm. maybe that's also a plan. Yeah, except scientists be as accurate as possible. Um, let me show you, let me show you this, um, let me show you this picture here. Uh, da -dum -dum -dum. <coughs> right, now what, what can you see here? Uh, you're not sharing the picture. You've still got your presentation shared. Okay, hang on a minute. Let me see. And Jenny's been trying to ask a question. So now, now what can you see? Okay, now we can see what looks like your computer screen with all of the tabs at the top. Okay, great. Okay, so this is this is what the this is what the scientist sees. This is Carter, and you go onto the web here and go into Carter, and this pulls what you're looking at here, this image, which has got this sort of purpley background. This is live, by the way, this is a live demo. This is a region of the Milky Way, that's the LMC, and this is 57 gigabytes, um, which is quite small, really. It's been compressed a lot, and uh, this has been... Uh, this is a particular project which is also looking at the polarity of light and what you've got you've got a, so you've got this image here which is rendered and then you've got a little uh, diagram down here which tells you certain things if you 
if you change, let's change the column up there. Um, so you can see now, you can, you can see this, this shape here much more clearly. This is all radio, by the way. Um, so it's not going to look like anything that we're used to seeing. Um, and you can see that there's, there's different, you know, different things are, uh, are visible when you choose different, uh, different colors. Um, but if you want the actual data, you've got widgets here. There's a whole stack of different widgets you can choose from, a spectral profiler, um, a stats widget. You've got, uh, you, can, you can create a region. Uh, you can overlay this with contours from somebody else's image uh, and see where, where the, you know, the heat areas are, where you have gases, for example, of different, uh, different, different heats. Um, or different uh, different spectral values, and uh, and so what? That's what you can do. You can just zoom in and make quite sophisticated maps, which are which which highlight whatever it is you're particularly interested in. Um, you might be interested to compare this image with with you know five other similar images of this area of sky, uh, in which case you know you'll bring in different images and you'll overlay them and you'll match them. And you'll see what's different because you've used different pipeline software to render before you rendered your image, um, and so you you know you want to see what is what is germane about that. You know how has your pipeline software created this image differently to other people's, and so on. So that's all about the reproducibility of science. Um, but so this is what the scientists do. They 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 bring in an image. And then they they just fiddle around with it and see okay well that looks interesting here you know what's what's going on over here and then they'll zoom in on this particular part and then um, decide to to you know really have a good look and and determine what other characteristics they can find out about this um, this area but as I say this this particular image is part of a project which is looking at light polarity. Um, and um, so it's using what's called the Stokes uh, Stokes widgets, and I have no idea how to use the Stokes widget. I have to say, um, that's getting into quite es esoteric uh, esoteric territory there. Um, and this is where we'd need a, an astronomer to give us a talk and uh, show us what happens when you highlight various uh, Stokes regions. You know, regions where you've got a, a polarity of light with a particular uh, quanta and then others, other regions which would correspond to a different kind of light polarity. Um, and then you can determine things like, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, galactic properties like how they're moving um, or where the magnetic fields lie in an area and things like that. Um, but I'm going to start waffling now if I carry on, so I'm not going to say much more about that. I just want to ask you, you say this is live is this live from SKA or what? No, this is live from Ilifu, which is the, the federated cloud system in Mowbray. So this data is being pulled to my computer uh, in parts from, um, or the image is being rendered there uh, in, in Mowbray, and then it's just being pushed to my computer. Uh, so I'm not having to deal with 57 gigabytes uh, on my hard drive. <laughs> no. So yeah, so this is this is um, this is a this was a, a an image taken for the Galfax project um, with the Alma computer. Uh, I believe it's the Alma. So this is the Atacama Large Submillimeter Array. So this isn't mere cut data. Um, there's obviously there's no SKA data yet because we're still we, we've not started the construction phase of SKA yet. That's still still yet to come. Um, yeah. Uh, so you should be able to see me now. Is that right? Yes, we can see you full screen. You can see me full screen. Oh no, that's terrifying. Let's put let's put this on. Put it on a gallery. I suppose it's the one who's speaking who's full screen. Um, any more questions? If I be quiet, then I'll come off full screen. All the data from SKA will that be used? be stored in South Africa or is it being distributed around the world? Uh, it'll be initially stored here and then distributed around the world. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it actually just changed the mind about, about where it's going. They were originally going to keep more up at Carnarfon, but they're going to send it all down to Cape Town. 
um, and um, and then it'll be you know sitting in data archives in particular formats, but not the raw data. So the raw visibilities are not going to be stored. There's too much of that. So they're going to make data products out of it, and then and then they're going to discard the the raw visibilities. Not not popular with many scientists. And then they're going to uh, fan the data products around the world. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was just going to ask you a question relating to the screen you had you, you showed. There were two graphs on the right hand side of the screen. And I was wondering what was represented on the X axis. Was it absorption spectra or the Kelvin? Oh, Kelvin on all three on all three graphs that you showed. Okay. Uh, just on the, the two on the right were, were, were Kelvin. And the one on the bottom was uh, the render configuration. Actually, that's also Kelvin values, but I'm not sure what that relates to. Um, okay. So yeah. But as I say, I'm not I'm not an astronomer, so I can't really walk through what these different graphs tell you. But you know, you can get a screen full of graphs, all these widgets, you know, showing you different different graphs for different characteristics. Um, and astronomers will be looking for particular characteristics that they have asked for um, when they design their observation. I just want to make a comment. I, I'm not comfortable with the idea of saying that the blue is receding and the red is approaching it. Just to me, it's not logical because, I mean, the wavelength is shortened by the approaching light and, and lengthened by the receding light. So, and lengthening okay. wavelength is more red and approach and shortening is more blue. Yeah, but it's just how the human eye works. And so I think that we are designed as mammals to respond to blood. And so we are, we focus more on the red and our eyes see red uh, a lot more clearly. And, um, you know, if, if you see something that's red, it's kind of, it's really coming towards you. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're driving at night and you see traffic lights, the red appears to be much brighter, but it's not. It's just, it appears to be brighter than the cooler green. Uh, and it's, it's designed that way, you know, because red is, you know, it's in your face. And so it's, uh, it's just how we as mammals are, are designed. Gitchell, I think that illustrates what I wanted to ask is that because people can interpret these colors in different ways, for instance, Derek seems to be looking at it in terms of redshift, blue shift and relative positions, whereas it's a visual thing which is not related to that. Is it important then that the person presenting the images, whether it's in 2D on a paper or on a computer screen, identifies what each color means. Yes, so and, and understand yeah. what actually is being presented rather than interpreting it for themselves. That's right, and and that's what what and one of the examples in the presentation, there was the the write up underneath the the figure, which explained you know what the different colors meant, and so yes, of course you know you, you have to produce a key. Yeah, uh, for, that's what the scientists have to do. But if you're producing, say, the Hubble Heritage pictures, and this is for the general public to enjoy, then you have to understand how most people view mm. objects and images. And you have to understand about the inherent properties of the human eye brain system, because you can't go explaining, you know, at great length. Uh, and, and of course, then it gets quite scientific very quickly. And you'll be talking about certain you know, certain frequencies and the general public are not going to understand that. Uh, so, you know, you have to, if, if, if you're J on English anyway, and you want to render something that's reasonably authentic to the general public, then you have to take these things in, into consideration how, how the eye sees things. So you don't have to go into a long explanation as scientists would. Yeah. So you have to bear in mind who your audience is going to be, who's going to be looking at the images. Yeah, and, and mostly who'll be looking at the images is other scientists. Mm. But increasingly, they'll be looking at images on screens or, or in planetaria or, yeah. you know, in, in special rooms and not on, a, you know, not, a, not in a, on a paper, on a two-dimensional paper. Mm. 
that's what's exciting because the data is just going to be unmanageable in in two dimensions yeah that just adds to the complexity and the challenge of getting information across which is accurate and mm. as you say authentic yeah and reproducible mm. Mm. Get to that, get that thing mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did somebody else talk? I was just going to ask, uh, can you comment also just on sound and how that maybe differs to light, where I think we looked at some CBM images at one stage of the, uh, where you had primordial sound almost from the Big Bang. Does that uh, yeah. also yeah. have those interpretations? I mean, what what's, what I think is, is more interesting than trying to interpret directly the sounds of the universe is sonification, where you can take any image and reduce it to sound uh, using complicated algorithms. And there used to be somebody called Wanda at, uh, who was at the, the uh, Astronomical Observatory here in Cape Town. And she was, she was a blind astronomer and working on sonification. And so that's, uh, that's again, it's another way of looking at, at the data. And what we'll find increasingly is that you'll have, you know, multi-wavelength images and, uh, you'll, you know, you'll overlay with some sort of uh, visual representation of gravitational waves as well. And, and then those will be in a three-dimensional context or in a, through a VR headset. And there'll be many, many ways of, of fastening onto what's interesting in the data and uh, not not just you know the uh, the screen or the the paper and i think that's that's a sort of the general message of what i'm getting across here and and that it is as you say it's, it gets very complicated very quickly amazing thank you Ketro, i seem to remember you saying that the raw data is not kept because there's simply too much mm. in 20 or 30 years time the will be different um, algorithms for extracting uh, useful information from that. Will it still be available if you use 20 year from now's algorithms? No, I, I, I mean, I think these, these algorithms are quite short lived and they're quite particular to a certain epoch when we have certain hardware available to us and you know we we have we've relied on moore's law it's built into the design of the, the square kilometer array we're relying on on there being the a, a, a crashing in price and an exponential increase in uh, in capability and uh, of, of computer chips so you know we need computers to get more and more powerful um, but uh, whether in the future they will be able to store raw visibilities, I don't know. I mean, there's some debate as to what, 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 is, what is particularly interesting in raw visibilities. If you trust the pipeline software that's been employed to render your data into some way which is more manageable, um, and uh, then, then you know, why would you need the, the, raw, the raw data? Why would you need the raw visibilities? Um, it's been... It's been a, a hot topic of debate for for quite a number of years, and I think it's it's almost been put to bed now. I think people are accepting that they'll get the data products and not the the raw stuff. But into the future, I mean, uh, who who knows? I mean, if we have tremendous amounts of computing power in in your little finger, uh, maybe uh, there'll be new ways of of analyzing it in new ways of transporting the data. Well, there must be, if you think of how we did things 30 years ago and how we're doing things now. Okay, to the, um, the 3D data and the uh, virtual reality data, is that just specific images from, from Meerkat, which have been rendered like that, or is, is it done on a, with a lot, a lot of various sort of uh, images from from uh, astronomy, or is it just re a, a small amount of specific things that have been visualized like that? Uh, at the mo at the moment, it's all test data. So this is all this is all, you know, in in the laboratory. It's called the VR lab because it's 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 not out there. It's still in the experimental stage. So um, so what you you know those those things that I showed you from the VR lab, they are 
they're experimental. They're taking data from wherever. You know, the, the galactic stuff, that's, the, the data set that's used in the VR uh, headsets, I think that that comes from the States somewhere. It might come from NASA. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but the, uh, the other data, it's, you know, wherever. I mean, the other day, um, the other day, I say the other day, it's like a year since I was, since I was on campus, but, um, you know, I was walking by the VR lab and they did have some meerkat data that they were, uh, they were showing up there. Um, on the big wall on the side, and they were enjoying looking at the amount of, of detail that they could get from it. I remember seeing recently um, a, a YouTube video, I think of the Tarantula Nebula, which I think it was NASA who had done a 3D rendering of it, and it was quite detailed, and they say they'd actually mm. learned a lot from it. I just mm. can't remember all the details. Yeah, yeah, you learn a lot more by, by looking at things in different dimensions, yeah. Mm. Any more questions? Yes, well, before you finish, I was just wondering if I could maybe bring up Indy's um, Facebook page just as an ad and his YouTube page just for everybody to see before they, before they log off. Um. Which which Facebook pages? The guy I introduced you to in the beginning, Engdefili from Spilici, his his Facebook page with his um, story where he talked about astronomy and so on. So when you're finished, uh, just let me know. Yeah, I've finished. It's time time for my biscuits now. You can send me a virtual biscuit. Okay, I think Derek will be more likely to send you um, a glass of red wine. Uh, now, Alka, glass. Alka's got two color illustrations to share. Let's let. Should we have a look? Should we see Alka's color illusions? Sure. Okay, you can go ahead and check. Uh, Can, can everybody see our full moon? Yeah, somebody holding it. Yeah, so the, the, you, get, you get these cool moon balls. You can buy them on Take A Lot. So um, here's a really, a, a really subtle color illusion. If you take a whole bunch of these full moons. We're, we're, not, we're not seeing the entirety of your screen. Maybe just double click on my name. You should see, do you see a whole bunch of full moons? Yeah, I yeah see I've pinned your video now. Okay, so you see a whole bunch of full moons, right? And if we just take a, a bunch of RGB stripes, just red, green, and blue stripes, and you overlay them on this image, then you get that. Wow. And if you let your eyes wander, don't stare, because that's cheating. <laughs> you should see that the moon globes appear to have different colors. That's amazing. I mean, this one looks to me bluish, but you know, it's it's the same image. It's this image, but we've just added the context of this color bar, which makes it quite interesting. But the one that always blows my mind is this horrible illusion. This one is is a beast that's been created in the in the depths of hell. So we've got a we've got a Rubik's cube. And I'd like you to look at the central, the central facet. This, I'm going to call it brown, but we'll see now why that is an absolute lie. So, you see, there's one on this face, one on the top, and one on the side. And the bit of insanity is that this facet, that central one, is the same color as the other two. In other words. This, this block over here, if I move it, it's the same color as there, and it's the same color as there. Amazing. That's there's absolutely no, amazing. There's no jiggery pokery with Photoshop here. These really are, I just literally just cut out that 
and you can do obviously this means the same you can look at the rgb value and you can see that it's the same number but the moment you have the full context of the darkened shadow, they appear to be different. Yet, if you drag them across, you see it's the same color. <laughs> so, it's just weird. Um, thanks, thanks for letting me share that. I, I absolutely love this one. <laughs> That's extraordinary. Yeah, okay. I seem to remember you flummoxing with me with some card tricks. So you've obviously a, a magician of note. This is not me. This is just our broken, clever brain. <laughs> okay, any other questions? <clears throat> Ketchel, can I then say thank you very much for all the, the effort of preparing what was a very, very fascinating and a most enjoyable talk. I'm sure everyone really did enjoy that. Thanks a lot. That was superb. <clears throat> It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Yeah, thank you, Ketchel. Thanks very much. Thank you. So okay, if you just give me a, if you just give me a minute, uh, Ketchel, I just want to try and bring up this Facebook page. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm not very good at this. I just wanted to give you a quick example of the guy's stuff. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Anybody got anything else to comment or ask? No, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and good night. <clears throat> night, everybody. Night, Ketchel. Thank you very much. That was actually fascinating. Cheers. Thanks, okay, we're going to log off now.